This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. We have a very exciting Parsha this week, Parshas B'Shalach, the nation. They are finally leaving Egypt. They've been there for hundreds of years. Of course, the Jewish people's odyssey in Egypt began a very long time ago. It began with Joseph. He had the dreams. He was sold into slavery. He ended up in Egypt. Eventually, the entire family followed. The nation burgeoned and expanded, and they spent hundreds of years in servitude, in subjugation to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and now it's time to leave. And the project begins that Pharaoh is sending them off, and they are going in a circuitous route in order to lock them in, to prevent them from returning back home. There is a concern, there is a fear that the nation will want to retreat and to regress and to go back home, which, of course, they viewed as Egypt. In addition, there is another justification for them to take a non-direct route, and that is to give the impression to the Egyptians that they are confused, 
and they're trapped and they don't know where to go. And that will goad Pharaoh to pursue them, which he does. He marshals all of his military might and he chases the nation and there's the final showdown and there's the standoff and the nation's pinned by the water and they're trapped and there's no way to escape. And they complain to Moshe and Moshe prays to God and ultimately the nation enters the water and the most memorable miracle occurs. The sea, the sea of reeds, the Amsaf, it splits and the nation walks in the dry land with walls of water on either side. Of course, after that happens, the nation erupts into song and they travel to Mara. And there the waters are sweetened. Of course, we have the manna, the miraculous food the nation ate for 40 years in the wilderness. We have the water coming out of the rock. This is the first time that that happens. Of course, it will happen again in the book of Numbers. And the Parsha ends with the war against Amalek. In this Parsha podcast, I want to focus on a fascinating subplot in our Parsha. Every Parsha, of course, is multi-layered and multi-dimensional. There are all sorts of interesting subplots to discuss and to ponder. And today I want to focus on the third verse of our Parsha and the bones of Joseph. So, of course, the Parsha begins, Pharaoh is sending the nation, and they're not going the way of the Philistines. That's a close way. No, because then maybe the nation will renege, will regress, and will want to turn back home. Instead, they go through the direction of the wilderness, towards Yam Suf, towards the Sea of Reeds, Vachamushim Alubin Yisrael and the nation ascended from Egypt, Chamushim, which Rashi tells us two interpretations. Either means that they were armed. The word Chamush means to be armed. Alternatively, the word Chamush is from the word Chamesh, which means which means five, only a fifth of the nation emerged. Verse 1, verse 2. Verse 3, Vayikach Moshe, and Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him. Why? Why Why is this so important? Because Joseph adjured the nation, and he told them before he passed, that God will redeem you. And when that happens, when the exodus happens, when we're finally going to leave here as a nation, you should Take with you my bones and inter me in the land of Canaan, in the land of Israel. That's the introduction. And then verse 4, they traveled. They traveled from Sukkos and they went to a place called Asam at the edge of the wilderness. So we're talking about the Exodus. And amid the discussion of the direction where the nation's going, they're not going the more direct route through the land of the Philistines. They're taking a more circuitous route, and they're heading towards the wilderness, towards the Sea of Reeds. And we're told right in the middle, verse 3, that Moshe took the bones of Joseph. Joseph passed away a long time ago, and he's no longer with us, but we still have his bones. And Moshe has taken them with him, with the nation, in order to bury him in the land of Israel. And why? Because Joseph adjured the Israelites that when God saves them, when God redeems them, when they leave, they should take his bones with them. Now, I did some calculations here. How many years ago was this oath administered? Was this adjournment? When, when did that happen? When did Joseph die? So the math, it's 139 years before the events of our parsha, before the Exodus. You do the math. Joseph was 17 when he went down to Egypt. Jacob came 22 years later. So Joseph was 39 years old. And that's when the 210-year clock begins because the Jewish people spent 210 years after Jacob arrived in Egypt. Joseph, we're told, at the very end of Genesis, he passed away at the age of 110. So that's 71 years into the 210 that the nation spent in Egypt. Thus, it's 109 years later, after the death of Joseph. And the Exodus is happening. And Moshe is telling us, or the Torah is telling us, 
that because Joseph made the nation swear 139 years prior to not forget his bones in Egypt, Moshe remembers that. He takes the bones of Joseph with them in the Exodus. Now, we actually have in the Torah, in the final two verses of Genesis, so Genesis chapter 50, verses 25 and 26, this is the description of the death of Joseph. And it tells us that Joseph adjured the sons of Israel, the Israelites. And he said, when God will redeem you, you take my bones up with you. And then the final verse of Genesis, Vayamas Yosef, Joseph died at the age of 110, and he was embalmed and placed in a box, in an ark, in a coffin, in Egypt. So the first observation I want to make about this interesting subplot of our parsha is the notion that Moshe has this presence of mind to remember this national responsibility, this national commitment that was made to Joseph when he adjured the nation, his contemporaries, before he died, don't forget about my bones. You know, most of us don't remember what happened yesterday, 39 days ago, 39 years ago for sure. How many of us remember what happened a hundred and thirty-nine years ago? How many of us are thinking about the responsibilities that we may have accepted collectively as a people, you know, more than a century ago? This is events, this is a timeline that's long escaped our collective memory. You know, now it's 2024. We're in the eighth year of the Parsha podcast, after all. So 139 years ago, it was the year 1885. What happened in 1885? Would we even have any sense of what happened then? I can think of only one person that knows what happened in 1885. That was that kid we spoke about last week, the the politics savant. What happened in 1885? That was the first term of Grover Cleveland. He was the only president to serve non-consecutive terms. <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking about interviewing him on the, on the podcast, making him like one of the official Parsha podcast mascots because his mastery of this subject is just so wondrous. 1885 is a long time ago. The death of Joseph was 139 years prior to the Exodus. And Moshe has the presence of mind to know that this needs to get done before the Exodus. Joseph adjured the people to do this, make sure you do this before the Exodus. And now we finally have the Exodus. And the Torah interrupts the whole narrative about which direction we're going and what's the plan and what's the itinerary and we're heading here in this direction and not that direction. And we travel from this place to that place. There's a whole verse that tells us that Moshe fulfilled the oath and the promise made to Joseph. And he took the bones of Joseph with him. Now, I will say that this is a pattern with with Moshe. Moshe keeps his word. A couple of years ago, we cited an incredible midrash. You recall back in Parshas Shmos. So, Shmos is the first installment of the book of Exodus. So, Shmos, Va'era, Bo, Beshalch. We're now in the fourth. In chapters three and four of Exodus, Moshe has been nominated. He's been commissioned by God to go Back to Egypt, he was a Midian at the time. He was a shepherd working for his father-in-law Jethro. He's commissioned by God, go save the Jewish people. And we remember what happened. Moshe begins to object, and he launches a volley of objections. And he says, it's not worthy, and what will I tell them, and what name of God, and they won't believe me, and Pharaoh won't believe me. Send Aaron instead. When Moshe finally accedes to go, he makes a pit stop before he heads down to Egypt. This is chapter 4 of the book of Exodus. Vayelach Moshe, Moshe went. Where did he go? He finally agrees. Okay, now he's going to do it. Before he goes down to Egypt. Vayashav al Yeser Chosanu, he returns to Yeser, which is one of the nicknames, one of the seven names of Jethro. 
he goes back to Jethro. Rashi tells us to take leave of Jethro and to ask permission to leave. Because Moshe made an oath to Jethro when he married Jethro's daughter, Zipporah, he promised he will not leave without permission. And now God, God Almighty, appeared to him with the burning bush, seven days of negotiations at Mount Sinai. And he's been given this sacrosanct mission, this vital mission to go save the Jewish people who are on the brink of total destruction in Egypt. And Moshe finally agrees. But he stops off and asks Jethro for permission to leave. And he says, I want to go back to my brothers who are in Egypt. This is in chapter 4, verse 18. Let me go see if they're still alive. Vayomer Yisro and Jethro says, Leich l'shalom, go in peace. So we would read this verse as just filling out the narrative. It's just telling us more about what happened. But there's not there's no empty verses in the Torah that are filler verses. And Rashi, of course, explains to us. This verse is telling us that even though Moshe was commissioned by God to undertake a vital, critical, essential, indispensable mission, nevertheless, he made a promise to Jethro. He's not going to leave without permission. He made a vow. He made an oath. And he will keep that vow. And yes, the nation is hanging on a thread. And the nation, the descendants of Abraham, they're at risk. And God Almighty gave you instructions. Moshe goes to consult with Jethro. He made an oath. And the hallmark of the greats, one of the hallmarks, is that they don't violate their oath. And it's implied from this verse that had Jethro said, you know what, I don't want you to go to Egypt. Egypt sounds dangerous. I was in Egypt. We know Jethro. His backstory was in Egypt. What if Jethro would have stood firm? Moshe would have remained in Midian. It's a fascinating thing. And the Midrash tells us that not only did Moshe behave properly in going to get permission from Jethro, this incident actually demonstrates Moshe's credentials. And the Midrash cites a verse in Psalms, chapter 24, me, Ya'aleh Baharashem, who will ascend the mountain of God? Who's going to go up to Mount Sinai and say, I'm going to get the Torah. I'm going to wrestle the Torah out of the heavens and bring it down to humanity. Umi, Yakumim, Kron, Kacho, who could stand up in God's holy place? There are four qualifications. Niti, Kapayim, someone has clean hands, meaning that they're not behaving in any sort of financial chicanery. Uvarle Vav, someone who has a pure heart. Someone who does not take a false oath and someone who does not swear deceitfully. And the Midrash goes and says, in each one of these four qualifications, Moshe was an exemplar. Velon Nishbal Ramad did not swear falsely. What's the example of Moshe's life that shows, that demonstrates that he does not swear falsely? When he married Zipporah. He swore to Jethro. He will not leave. He will not abandon Midian without Jethro's permission. And when God appointed him, God commissioned him, God directed him, go to Egypt, he stopped off by Jethro. Now remember, Jethro, like, he's a good guy. We like him here on the Parsha podcast. We've done a bunch of Jethro podcasts. And we noted how special he is. He has seven names. He's a very dynamic personality. He used to be a connoisseur, a Kanye Shanti of idolatry, but he came around, he became a convert. Jethro is special, but if God asks you to do something, you don't ask Jethro for permission. We would have thought. This shows us the imperative of keeping your word. Why did Moshe merit to ascend the mountain of God? What were his qualifications? There were four. One of them is... He did not violate an oath. He never swore swore deceitfully. Even though it means abandoning the plight of the Jewish nation, Moshe does not violate an oath. Moshe's word is gold. Nay, it's platinum. Nay, it's palladium. 
If Moshe gives his word, he keeps his word. If there is the collective oath of the Jewish people, the people swore to Joseph, we are not leaving without you. We're not going to leave you behind. Moshe does that. And this was easier said than done. The Midrash tells us that Moshe had no idea where the bones of Joseph were. You can imagine trying to find bones in Egypt, right? They keep all their rulers around. They mummify them and put them in all these little chambers and all these hiding spaces. They find them today, right? They go and they find all these crypts and all these burial spots and all these ossuaries. Go find Joseph in Egypt. He was placed in Egypt. No one knows where he is. And the Midrash tells us that when Moshe, when it was about to have the Exodus, we know that they prepared. They were doing the pastoral offering, separating the animal four days before the Exodus, and then they actually slaughtered the animal. They took the blood, put the doorposts. For three days and three nights, that's what the Midrash tells us, Moshe is going around the city trying to find the coffin of Joseph. Says the Midrash, because they could not leave Egypt if they did not have Joseph with them. It was impossible to leave. Joseph told them, when you leave, you take me with you. A precondition for the Exodus is that the bones of Joseph are accompanying the nation. After three days and three nights of fruitless searching, Moshe encounters a very old woman, the daughter of Asher, Serach Bas Asher. She was the one who informed Jacob about the fact that Joseph is still alive. And the Midrash tells us she did it with some song. She kind of prepared Jacob for the very important news. And when Jacob heard that Joseph was still alive, the spirit of Jacob was given life. And because she participated in that, she gave life to Jacob. She was rewarded with a very long life. So she's still around, the Midrash tells us. And she sees Moshe, and he's all sweaty, and he's haggard looking. He spent now three days and three nights looking for this elusive coffin. And she says to him, why are you so, why you look so tired and sweaty? And he says, I'm, I'm trying to find the bones of Joseph. He says, I know, I remember what happened. I remember where they put it. I'll show you. And she brings him to the stream. And she says, I remember they made a very heavy box. And there were all these sorcerers and necromancers and soothsayers of Egypt putting all these spells to make sure that it does not ever come out. They put the body of Joseph in this box, a very heavy box. They submerged it in the water and they added all these spells to protect, so to speak, the coffin so it can never be extracted. Why? Because they also knew that the exodus can only happen with the bones of Joseph accompanying the nation. And we'll hide the bones, they reasoned, and no one will find them, and the Jews will never be able to leave. So Moshe goes to the edge of this stream, and he tries to summon Joseph. And he says, Joseph, 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 you know that you swore to the Jewish people that when they leave, they'll take your bones with you. Don't stop the redemption from happening. Ascend from the depths. And the Midrash describes that suddenly the uh, the coffin of Joseph began to bubble upwards. And Moshe took it. Of course, there's a Midrash that says that he actually threw something into the water. This metal disc, this metal plate that had on it, Alei Shar, Ascend, O Ox. But Moshe starts schlepping. He's dragging this very heavy box, this very heavy ark. And everyone's schlepping stuff. Everyone's pulling heavy things. Because the Jewish people that night, the night of the Exodus, 
they were instructed to go request to borrow from all their Egyptian friends and neighbors, give us items of gold and silver because we need it for our trip. And the Almighty gave them a supernatural charm and grace in the eyes of the Egyptians, and they just lent them everything. So everyone's dragging this, this, these heavy satchels. They're taking all the gold, and Moshe is taking the very heavy box that contains the bones of Joseph. And the Midrash concludes that because Moshe was so dedicated in the burial of Joseph, he tended to Joseph in such a devoted fashion. That's why God tended to Moshe. Moshe was buried by God. That's, of course, at the end of the Torah. So there's a very interesting subplot here in the Parsha. Moshe is scouring Egypt for three days and three nights to find the bones of Joseph. And he meets Sarah, and she shows him where the body was placed. And the Egyptians also understood that Joseph would enable the Jewish people to leave. So they took extraordinary measures to keep him there. And Moshe uses some perhaps very unorthodox methods to extract the bones of Joseph. And Moshe was richly rewarded for this. This is the reason why God tended to Moshe when he needed to be buried, because Moshe tended to Joseph. For that reason, God tended to him. So again, we're marveling at the presence of mind of Moshe. Everyone's dealing with the hectic preparations for the Exodus. You know, it's like the day before a big trip, the day before a vacation. If you're going to fly... I make sure you have everything, and I get the passports and all the baggage. Don't forget Kevin at home. You know, we actually, even though we were blessed with a, a baby a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago yesterday, we're actually traveling this week, please God, because my brother-in-law is getting married, so we're going to join the festivities in Canada. So just today, I went to the Houston passport office, to get a passport for the baby. And it's not so easy because the baby, you have to have a, a social security number and a birth certificate. But we got it all. We got the passport. Actually, I have the passport right here on my desk in the torch center. I went to pick it up. I said, I'm going to go downtown to pick it up because we, we were there this morning. Pick it up at two o'clock, pick it up and come back here and record the podcast. But it's very hectic. Before you go, you got to make sure everyone has their stuff. But imagine... You're leaving a country that you spent hundreds of years there. What's it like to pack up and move? We're going into the wilderness. We're following God. Moreover, it's not just to move. There's all sorts of things they need to do. You have the pastoral offering. You've got to take the sheep and tie it to your bed and watch it for four days and then offer it, really sacrifice it, but then take the meat and roast it, and take all the blood, put it on the, on the doorposts. And they got to do the circumcision the night before. And they have to borrow the gold, the silver from your Egyptian friends in order to fulfill the promise made to Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis. And afterwards, they will leave with great wealth. So there's an enormous checklist that the people have. Everyone's busy. But Moshe, he's focusing on something that no one else is focusing on. He's spending three days and three nights looking for the bones of Joseph. So I think this shows us the presence of mind of a leader to know what needs to get done, to understand what the responsibilities are, what the absolute imperative is for the nation to fulfill the collective oath that was made to Joseph. But if you examine this a bit more deeply, I think there's a a very important question that we need to ponder. Why is this, in fact, so significant? Why does it really matter? What happens if we just leave Joseph behind? If we just forgot, we forget about Joseph. Why is it so important that the nation takes his bones with them? Why was it important for Joseph to be so insistent that his bones be taken with the nation? It seems, again, the Midrash tells us that the Exodus could not have happened without the bones of Joseph. The Egyptians knew that. Joseph himself knew that. 
And Moshe knew that. Everyone else maybe didn't. We're talking about the Exodus, like the, the few verses that begin our parasha. The nation's leaving, and part of this whole story is the bones of Joseph are accompanying them. This is part of the Exodus, because absent this, there cannot be an Exodus. If Joseph remains in Egypt, we all remain with him. But it's not clear why. Why can we say, Joseph, you're a great hero, we appreciate everything you did for us, but alas, you're going to remain in Egypt. It seems like that that's not a possibility. If Joseph remains in Egypt, so do they. The Exodus cannot proceed absent Joseph. And it's not, it's not clear why. Now, I did look back at my notes from last year, from year seven of the Parsha podcast. The theme was, you recall, was we're trying to raise your Parsha IQ. And we have an idea or an insight. And then we end the podcast with a question. So Parshas Bishalach, this week's Parsha, last year, this was the question. And I said, okay, I already spoke about this. But it was just the question. And I, I remember at the end of the podcast, it said, we're just going to savor this. We're just going to enjoy the question. You didn't get an answer. Well, it's worth the wait. I want to share three different ideas in the spirit of year eight of the Parsha podcast. Deep and deeper. Let's go a bit deeper beneath the surface in the bones of Joseph element of the Exodus. If you read the opening verses of our Parsha, you'll notice a strange segue. So we have the nation leaving. And we're told in the second verse of the parsha, Bahamushim, they, they went out armed. So Rashi tells us simply means that they were armed, they had weapons, maybe it means that they only left a fifth of them, only a fifth of them left, the rest of them stayed behind. But the simple interpretation is that the Jewish people were armed. And the very next verse, Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him. Why do we have this very unusual segue, very strange segue, from the nation being armed to Moshe taking the bones of Joseph because of the oath that was adjured to the Israelites? So one of the commentaries, the Kleocra, says something unbelievable. He cites the Midrash. The Midrash says that this coffin of Joseph accompanied the nation throughout their journeys. It's going to be 40 years in the wilderness and they're going to be traveling and the rest of the Torah tells the story of these 40 years. And they have with them at all times the bones of Joseph in a box. The word for the box is an aron, which means a box, but also means an, an ark. And the Midrash tells us that there were two aronot, two arons, as we would say. There was the ark of the covenant. That's the ark that's going to be built later on in the book of Exodus. The ark made of gold, gold inside, gold outside, with wood in the middle. In it, you're going to have, of course, the tablets, both the first set of tablets that were shattered and the second set of tablets that were not shattered. Ultimately, the Torah scroll that Moshe is going to write is also going to be placed in it. And it's capped, it's covered with, of course, the golden cherubs. This ark, of course, symbolizes Torah. The great gift that the Almighty gave the Jewish people. So you have two arks. The ark that contains the bones of Joseph and the ark that contains the tablets. And they went side by side. And for 40 years, the nation has these two arks that are almost leading the nation. And everyone they passed would inquire, why do you have a coffin, a box with bones? 
bones of the dead. And it's traveling alongside the box, the ark of he who is eternally living, i.e. God. It seems incongruent to have these two, these two boxes travel alongside each other. They seem to be opposites. One's, you know, the, the, the ark of God. It's completely suffused with life and vitality. And this is a box that has bones. It contains the dead. And they would respond to those who would inquire and say, no, no, they're, they're, they're the same. This one, i.e. Joseph, he fulfilled what it says in this one, i.e. Torah. And the Midrash continues, and it goes through all Ten Commandments, and it demonstrates how Joseph was the paragon of all these Ten Commandments. Of course, the Ten Commandments start off, I am the Lord your God. What does Joseph say at the end of Genesis, when his brothers are worried that he's going to punish them for what they did to him after Jacob passes? He says, am I instead of God? Hatachas Elohim Anochi, am I Anochi, am I instead of God? Joseph demonstrates that he completely submits to the Anochi, so to speak, to I am the Lord your God of the first of the Ten Commandments. And it goes on one after another after another. You should not have any foreign gods. That is the second of the Ten Commandments which, of course, we will read in Netsh's Parsha. And it cites, again, an example where Joseph embodies this. In chapter 42, verse 18, Joseph says, Es ha'elokim I am fearful of God and God alone. Don't take God's name in vain. When Joseph swore falsely in chapter 42, verse 15, he swears in the name of Pharaoh. Rashi even points out over there. When he swears falsely, it's only in the name of Pharaoh. And so on, one after another, the Midrash proves that Joseph is the perfect embodiment, the personification of the Ten Commandments of the Torah. And therefore, it's very appropriate to say, Joseph, you go right alongside the other ark, the ark that contains the bones of Joseph, that will travel alongside the other ark, the ark of the covenant. Says the Kliyakar, unbelievable idea. The Jewish people were told in the second verse of our Parsha, they were armed. In the very next verse, it tells us what they were armed with. What is the weaponry of the Jewish people? How do we historically go into battle? What is our true weaponry? That, of course, is the Torah. And in fact, when the nation actually went to war, they took the ark with them. Why? Because that is how we historically have gone to war. With the power, the full force of the Amayas Torah behind us. And that's wonderful. After Sinai. After Sinai and the nation builds the tabernacle, and they actually receive the Torah, and they find a, a permanent home for the tablets in the ark. But now we're at the Exodus. The Jewish people have not yet received the Torah. They have not yet had the revelation at Sinai, and they have not yet built the ark of the covenant. So how do we go into war now? What is the weaponry that we take with us? The verse tells us there's this unusual segue. They were armed. Oh, and they have the bones of Joseph. No, no, no. That's not two random, unconnected elements of the story. They were armed with the bones of Joseph because the bones of Joseph were the equivalent of the Ark. And just as the Jewish people would go into war with the Ark of the Covenant, the thing that is indistinguishable, the other Ark, so to speak, the Ark that went alongside the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark that contained the bones of Joseph, Joseph, the embodiment of the Torah, the person who personified, who exemplified the steadfast adherence to Torah. That's what we went into battle with. That is what we were armed with. And therefore the verse tells us, 
Moshe took these bones. These bones were the equivalent of the tablets. This box is the equivalent of the Ark of the Covenant. It's an amazing observation. The word Aron, which means Ark. According to my research, the first time this word appears in the Torah, it's with respect to the coffin, to the box in which Joseph was place, placed. In the final verse of Genesis, Vayisem, the final words of Genesis, Vayisem Ba'aron, he was placed in an Aron, in an ark in Egypt. The first time this word appears in the Torah is with respect not to some other box, some other ark. It's with, with respect to Joseph. This is what it means to be an ark. The coffin of Joseph. That's the embodiment of the Torah. This is the personification of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And this is the weaponry the nation takes out of Egypt with them. Of course, we know that Torah is the protection of the nation. And we need an ark to lead us into battle. And either ark will do. The nations that we encounter, they they see a big discrepancy between this ark and that ark. They say, it's not fitting. How could you have the ark of the covenant? And alongside that, you have the ark, the box that contains bones of some old guy that died 150 years ago. That's how they view it. But we say, no, 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 they're the same. And just as the Jewish people went into war with the Ark of the Covenant, they go into war. They're armed with the ordinance of the Ark of the Bones of Joseph. You think about the end of the parasha, the nation went to war against Amalek. We had no Ark. We did. We had no arms. We did. The Ark and the arms and the weaponry was the bones of Joseph. You know, we already have talked about in the past the other major event, or at least maybe the most memorable event of our parsha, maybe even the most memorable event of the whole Torah. The splitting of the sea. The sea ran away. It fled. The verse in Psalms tells us, Hayam ra'avayanos. The sea saw something. C spelled S-E-A, saw something. What did the C, S-E-A, C, S-E-E? Why did it flee? So the Midrash tells us it fled because it saw the bones of Joseph. Joseph, when he was prepositioned by his master's wife, he fled, the verse tells us, 39, 14 of Genesis. He left his garments with her, Vayanas, and he fled. Vayetze hachutza, and he went outside. That became permanently embedded in the bones of Joseph. And when the sea saw that, the sea split. This is the nation's weaponry, the bones of Joseph. And this is perhaps one idea why it's so imperative to locate them. You're not going to go into battle without any weapons. Sure, we'll have the Torah, and we'll get the weapons of the Torah and the Ark of the Covenant in which the tablets are placed. But before we leave, we have to have something, we have to have arms, we have to be chamush, we have to be armed. Get those bones. That will lead us into battle. That Ark will help us overcome and trounce our enemies. An incredible idea, and that's just the first idea that I want to share with you today. On the Parsha podcast. Of course, we like to go a, a bit deeper. And we start off going deep, and then we go deep and deeper. Dad. So let's take this maybe a notch deeper. Joseph is about to die. And he tells, he tells someone, he tells the people. He adjures them. Take my bones with you. And again, that's mentioned in the beginning of our parsha, but it's also featured at the end of, of Genesis. Now, who exactly did Joseph adjure? Who did he make sure that they would swear, that they would vow 
to fulfill his wishes. So you look at the Rashi in the verse in our Parsha. Rashi stresses that unlike Jacob, who made his son Joseph a juror, he made him swear, Joseph did not ask his sons to swear. Rather, he asked his brothers. This is interesting. Why did Joseph ask his brothers to swear? Rashi says he asked his brothers, so they made their children swear. But isn't it interesting that there's a difference between, between Jacob's oath that he administered to not be buried in Egypt and the oath that Joseph administered to not be buried in Egypt or to be brought out of Egypt, to have his bones brought out of Egypt when the nation leaves. There's another observation, an extra word observation. This is an extra word alert. You know, when we say we're going a bit deeper this year in the Parsha podcast, it means that if we find an extra word that seems to be superfluous, we have to figure out what the lesson is. There's no extra words in the Torah. There's no filler words. And of course, it always helps if you could read Hebrew and understand Hebrew. But if you read the verse in Hebrew, you'll see the second to last word, the penultimate word of this verse. It seems to be a bit extra. Moshe took the bones of Joseph with him why? Because there was there was an oath that Joseph adjured the sons of Israel, the Israelites, to, and he said, God will save you. And you will ascend, you will take up my bones. The word mizeh means from this, maybe? How would you translate it? Mizeh, from this? But if you just omitted that word, and you say, the word would, the verse would make a ton of sense. There'd be nothing missing. So why is there an extra word, or apparently extra word? So I saw in one of the books that I, I read this week on the Parsha, something unbelievable. He says that, you know, Jewish people, we have we have some history. Yeah, we've done things that maybe, maybe were suboptimal. Things that we are not proud of. And of course, that leads to us being in the crosshairs of all these heavenly forces. You, God forbid someone were to do a sin. Well, there's now an angel that's coming after you. And if we collectively as a nation do a sin, well, then there is a, is a terrible blemish on the nation. The sources tell us that there were two mega sins that the Jewish people did collectively as a nation. And all of our troubles and all of our problems stem from these two sins that we did collectively as a nation. And of course... Every transgression can fall into one of two categories. It could be an interpersonal sin, where you sin against your fellow man or woman. Or it could be a sin that a human commits against God. And the two grand sins that our nation has con- that has committed over the course of our history, one of them is between man and man, interpersonal sin. And one is between humanity and God. And all of our troubles, the sources tell us, they stem from these two transgressions. The sin between man and God that we did is the sin of the golden calf. We know the story. Jewish people are waiting for Moshe to come down from the mountain. He tarries or he appears to tarry. And they say, we need a replacement. And they very eagerly take all the gold and make this golden calf and Aaron seems to be complicit in it to some extent. And there seems to be some measure of idolatry only, you know, a month and change after the after the revelation at Sinai. And that's a sin that the Jewish people are still trying to rectify. 
And the interpersonal sin that causes us pain and anguish is the sin of the sale of Joseph. Joseph's brothers committed an unconscionable crime. They sold their brother as a slave. It's hard to imagine. The Jewish people, our antecedents, our ancestors, did something which is really, it's unforgivable, right? To sell your own brother as a slave. And the commentaries note that in both of these sins, this mysterious word, ze, this apparently extra word ze, appears. In chapter 32 of Exodus, we read about the sin of the golden calf. Ki ze Moshe ish. The verse tells us that they're saying that Moshe is no longer with us. The, ver- the verse says, doesn't say because Moshe, because this Moshe. Again, it seems to be an extra word, ze. In the sale of Joseph, the verse says, nas u mi ze. They have departed from the word ze. And the commentaries tell us that the word ze, the gematria is, is 12, because the, the, the 12 brothers are now breaking up, so they have departed from ze. Joseph, before he dies, in his special magnanimity, he's very insistent on finding a way to rectify the tremendous rift that happened amongst this family. And he wants to resolve and cleanse and expiate the sin of the sale of Joseph. So he tells his brothers, specifically his brothers, make sure that you do something That may be difficult. That may be inconvenient. Do something to restore this brotherhood. And the verse says that Joseph made the nation swear to take up my bones. That's perhaps an indication that this is the way to rectify this horrific sin and clear the path towards cleansing, so to speak, the remnants of this, of this incident, this, this horrible, horrific incident of our nation, this black eye on our nation's history. And I would imagine, according to this idea, the Jewish people, this great destiny that the nation is marching towards, this cannot happen if the stench, if the blemish, if the remnants of that horrific sin still linger with us. The Jewish people are leaving Egypt. They're not just leaving Egypt. They're going towards someplace. They're going towards Sinai. They're going towards this elevated, ethereal living, where they're living almost like angels. They're going to have food of angels, the manna, of course. And they're going to be with Moshe, enveloped by these clouds of glory for 40 years. And they're going to be utterly transformed to become the nation of God. It cannot happen if the vestiges of the sin of the sale of Joseph linger. And therefore Moshe says, we have to remember this. We have to take the bones of Joseph with us. We have to restore the brotherly love and fraternity that existed prior Let's rectify the zest, so to speak, and clear the path towards the grand greatness that is before us. And finally, I want to end with an observation. Moshe is leading the Jewish people in the Exodus. But if you look at his immediate history that preceded this, he was the cause one may argue, for the slavery, for the servitude. Certainly the servitude of the moments prior to the Exodus. Moshe comes and he says he has this prophecy from God and he convinces the Jewish people to uh, follow him, to go demand the nation be released. He goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh laughs at him. And Pharaoh says, you think I'm going to improve the situation of the Jewish people? I'm going to make it worse. 
And Farah, of course, withdraws the critical ingredients needed for the bricks, but he maintains the quota. And thus, Moshe is the impetus for the intensification and the exacerbation of the servitude. And now what's he doing? Now, he, now he's spearheading the Exodus and this ascent to transcendental greatness. So the thing that seems to get us into the exile, well, that's that's what's getting us out and directing us towards glory and greatness. On a similar level, Joseph, he's the catalyst for the nation or the family of Israel to descend to Egypt. And I find it striking that he's the cause, of course, unwittingly, but he's the cause of the nation's descent to Egypt. And I find it beautiful that it's only through Joseph that the nation will be able to leave. The splitting of the sea, what did it, it split? Why did it split? And who's merit in the merit of Joseph? The Exodus, the Egyptians know, Moshe knows, Joseph knows, it can only happen if the bones of Joseph are retrieved. So I find it that, uh, just a beautiful observation from this whole subject. The things that seem to be the cause of the downfall, of the submergence into a quagmire. That's actually what's going to get a person out of it. Or that at least contains the roots, the kernels of the, of the Exodus. I think this is an idea that we've spoken about in the past as well. The aspects of our life, the aspects of our personality that bedevil us more than any other, those are the ones that contain within them the kernels of our transcendental greatness. The Yitzhahara, we talk about the Yitzhahara so much here on the podcast. What's the purpose of the Yitzhahara? The purpose is to enable us to achieve greatness. And the greater you are, the greater your Yitzhahara is. Why? Because that is what you need to reach your greatness. The Midrash, we love this Midrash, tells us that when God saw all that he made, it was it was good, but it was exceedingly good. Tov, maod, very, very good. Tov, zayetz or tov. When it says tov, it means the good inclination. Maod, when it says that God's creation is, is, is amazing, is exceptional, is phenomenal, is extraordinary. That's a reference to the evil inclination. The forces, the drives, the impulses, the difficulties that initially destabilize us, that throw us, that plunge us into the Egypts that we may be subjected to, they are the ones that will ultimately bring us to the greatness that is our destiny. So we have lots of lessons here from the bones of Joseph. And you know what? In previous years of the Parish of Podcast, we would say, eh, it's a little factoid. We can disregard it. It's a minor factoid. But of course, there's nothing minor in the Torah. And there's no factoids in the Torah. And this year, we, we choose Dad to go deep and deeper and to see all the layers and the substrate of insight. And we learned. The bones of Joseph taught us. Torah is our super weapon. The Jewish people, they left Egypt. They were armed. What were we armed with? The Ark. Which Ark? Both Arks. The Ark of the Covenant and the Aron, the Ark of Joseph. He exemplified adherence to the Ten Commandments. He had unbending fastidiousness to Torah. And that is our trump card. That is the ace up our sleeves. We learn from the bones of Joseph that the responsibility was specifically foisted upon the brothers why? So it can serve as a remedy to expiate the awful sin of the sale of Joseph. And it will clear the path towards Sinai and all the prestige and greatness that is awaiting the nation. And finally, we ended with a remarkable observation. That that seems to be your greatest challenge? What's putting you down? What's dragging you into the morass? 
that will ultimately be the thing, maybe the only thing, that will pull you out of this depression, of this quagmire, and towards the glorious destiny that awaits us. May we all be so fortunate to overcome our challenges and to find the roots, the kernels of our greatness within it. May we hear good news from our brothers and sisters in Israel. Of course, it was a very difficult week. It was a, I'm sure you all know about, about this right by now, there was a terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy. So many soldiers died. I don't, I don't know how this ends. I don't know what we can do besides for pray and to study and to do what we can to support the soldiers and to support the cause of our land and our country and our nation. I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a difficult, very difficult time and it's very painful. And of course, we're hoping and praying that our study and our mitzvos will be attributed towards the well-being and the safety of the soldiers in battle and uh, the hostages, of course. And we hope to only hear good tidings and good news from Israel and, all, of course, from all of y'all. My email address is rabbiwobajim.com. I appreciate your time, your attention. Have a wonderful day, a splendid, stupendous, uplifting, invigorating Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we'll talk again. Next week for Parshas Yisro, the email address is RabbiWolby at gmail.com.